Our speaker tonight, our next one, is Sam Carpenter, who's a Bend businessman and the CEO of Centratel National Telephone Answering Service, and they deal with emergencies. They are not those people who call you and make sales <laughs> pitches. Sam is running for the position of governor of the state of Oregon. In addition to his business, he is the author of two books on business management. He hasn't held public office, but he did seek to unseat Ron Wyden. He cares about our state a lot. And he comes to us tonight as a brand new groom, having recently married his lovely new wife, Diana, who is with us tonight also. Also with them is Gulliver, who is his campaign manager. But we want to hear from Sam why he wants to be governor and what he can do and wants to do for this lovely state of Oregon. Sam? Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Veterans out there, raise your hand at least. Thank you. Thank you so much from all of us. And I would like to introduce my bride, Diana Bybee, who can talk Southern because she's from Kentucky, which is on the Mason-Dixon line. And uh, she gave up her career, left her, left her family. I, I'm trying to find words to say, well, you were in Stearns, Kentucky for 40 years, in a profession there, gave up your job to marry me and come out here and help me campaign, very politically motivated. You think I'm conservative? Spend a few minutes with her. <laughs> you better make it as governor's yeah. <laughs> She's wonderful, and I thank her so much for giving up everything. We just built a house in Kentucky, and I, we were 80% done with the house and decided to run for this race, and we finished up that house, and we came out here with our Subaru SUV, which wasn't welcome in your little town there. It needed to come back and find its own kind. <laughs> The only Subaru in town. So we threw the coon hound, literally, coon hound into the car and we drove out here and now we're here again. And I've always had a house in Bend. I've been in Bend for 40 years. I have two kids, three grandkids. Uh, I want to, before I forget, be sure to vote on 101 and get everybody you can vote no on 101. We're really in the campaign putting a big push on the no on 101. And the campaign's done some robocalls and the campaign's done some Facebook posts, and uh, we're pretty excited about seeing Julie Parrish and Cedric and yes, seeing that thing happen, because that will portend well for what happens in November, right. if we can win that baby. I really think that we have a chance of doing it. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my background. I'll work through I think six mistakes we Republicans have been making through the years and why this is going to turn out differently. And if you follow my uh, web page, uh, Make Oregon Great Again, read into it, <laughs> you'll be correct. And uh, uh, Facebook page is Sam Carpenter for Oregon and we're pushing 60,000 likes on that page right now. We're gaining 300 a day. It's organic. It's on fire, the grassroots is on fire, and I will talk to you, and I'm going to give you some stats tonight that I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, I have spent, since September 1st, when I started thinking I might want to run, I wanted to get a feel for what was happening. Uh, since September 1st, I've been posting a lot on Facebook, emailing, talking to people on the phone, and I've talked to literally tens of thousands of Oregon voters uh, right up until now and I continue to answer every comment on my Facebook page and there's hundreds a day, sometimes a thousand a day. I spend eight to ten hours sometimes in a day. I've been doing this seven days a week since September 1st talking to you folks, people just like you folks. Uh, the announcement video that's on the front page of the website has been seen by over a quarter of a million Oregonians. 
Uh, it goes on and on. It's 15 minutes, but I cover everything, man. And I, we do the stats, and most people watch two minutes of it, and they see that I don't drool, <laughs> that I'm a halfway reasonable candidate. But a lot of people watch it all the way through, and I talk about all the uh, things, things that need to be fixed. I'm not going to spend any time tonight really talking about what's wrong. We've been talking about it for nine years. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is where we are and where we're going and some very exciting uh, news about where we are now. Uh, one thing that I find particularly exciting, and so does my team, David Gulliver, my policy analyst, and Diana, and a couple other full-time people, and some part-time people, we find this very exciting that a Zogby poll showed up. Uh, one of our people, actually we've got quite a contingent of college students interested in what's going on, and one of our guys, CJ, down at the University of Oregon, where I had a wonderful presentation down there about a month ago, dug up a Zogby poll that the media has not talked about, nobody even knew was out there. November 15th, I was one percentage point behind Kate Brown, one percentage point, two percent uh, ahead of Newt Bueller in the race. We are the leaders in the race. Uh, just started fundraising. You see the envelope there. Help us out if you possibly can. But we're going to win this primary spending probably 10 percent of what my main competitor spends. We will win the uh, general probably spending under 20 percent of what Kate Brown spends. Why? Because I am a organizational expert. I'm a communications expert. Uh, I have, let me talk about that a little bit. So I'll go backwards. We have a business called Centratel. I've had it for 33 years, 33 plus years in Bend. It has 48 people. 44 of them are women. All my top management spots except one uh, are held by women. And it is number one in its industry. And it is an old time telephone answering service, but it is very high tech. Uh, I spent a lot of time getting it right. It's now number one in the industry and it's highly profitable. And my people make a lot of money. I've got six people there who have worked for me for an average of over 20 years. I've got a couple of ladies who've worked for me darn close to 30 years now. So I'm a pretty good boss. But from that experience, I wrote a book called Work the System, The Simple Mechanics of Making More and Working Less. It's in its third edition. It's a business bestseller. And we've built a business out of that. And that business is to go into other businesses, small to medium-sized businesses. Although we've worked with businesses up to a half a billion dollars in annual revenue, most of our businesses are under 10 million. And we've fixed 500 businesses in the last seven years, my partner and me. Josh Fonger, some of you have met him, but he's done most of the field work, but it's based on the principles of that book. <clears throat> and of course, for me, I want to go to Salem and do something that nobody else has advertised they could do and fix that dysfunctional system. And we could talk about the bridge study and the exchange fiasco and the debacle of the healthcare providers, the CCO problem, but that's just part of it. Those obvious dysfunctions are just part of what's going on. It's the everyday dysfunction that needs to be addressed. Everyday dysfunction. John knows what I'm talking about. He deals with it. You just came out of the state, David. You could go on and on. It is incredibly dysfunctional. PERS, I mean, we won't get into all of that stuff, but let me tell you, it needs to have a whole lot less people in the government, and a lot of those agencies can be privatized, and a whole lot of those department heads and those steering committees need to go away because they're full of progressive far-left people. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to go very quickly here through some statistics with you. Um, <clears throat> oh, let me give you a quote from Dennis Richardson on business uh, functionality. And he went in and he took, a, took apart the healthcare, the latest healthcare debacle. And I paraphrase this a little bit. It's a quote that was in the paper. And what I love about Richard, uh, Dennis Richardson is he did what he said he would do regarding getting inside. You all remember him campaigning? He said, I'm going to get inside that, that baby and tear it apart. And by the way, when I get inside and take care of it, it won't be with a scalpel. It'll be with a chainsaw. <laughs> the recommendations including, and this is the newspaper report, and again, I paraphrased a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the recommendations included setting clearer standards, promoting integrity, 
making clear punishments for improper actions, tightening oversight, ensuring contractors know the rules, tracking payments, and ensuring an annual reconciliation of customers. That's just business stuff. Why should the government not have to deal with things on that level. Well, I'll tell you well, why, and John will, and all of you will agree, it's other people spending other people's money. Government is inherently flawed. We all know that. So what's the solution? Less, Less of it. <laughs> it's, it. We need the roads, we need the military, we need, we need all the things we need. We need a judicial system. We need all that stuff, but we don't need subsidies for people who make $75,000 a year with their family. We don't. It's getting real expensive, we're going into huge debt, and that of course is the bottom line, is how much debt does the state have? And as John and I were talking, I keep mentioning John here, but you know, the, what's happened here over the last 30 years, and I'll talk about progressive far left leadership, is you create a mechanism and then you just leave it. And I don't care whether you're talking about the roads, or the forests, or PERS, you don't create it and just I'm tired of that metaphor about kicking the can down the road, but that's a perfect metaphor. You've got to do something. You've got to look ahead. If you're running a private business, you've got to be looking two or three years ahead of time. And I go to my management staff down there at Centratel, and I say, I really think we need to be looking at this. I'm going to give you managers a year to think about it, but I think we've got to go in this direction. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you do a lot of times, and you've got to step out there, and you've got to be on the cutting edge. Donald Trump is that kind of a guy. Okay, statistics, let me give you some statistics out of my head. 90% of Republican 3-4 and 4-4 voters support Donald Trump. 70%, it's just under 90, just under 70% support him strongly, strongly. So think about that in the general. Think about your candidates for governor. Think about it in the primary. How's that gonna turn out? So we're feeling pretty good about the primary right now. We've done a number of polls. We've done three separate, very expensive, independent Triton, Triton polls, Triton polling. Uh, we didn't take our numbers, we took independent numbers, because what we have to have is the truth. We want to know what the truth is. And I talked to somebody today about doing some polling about something, and I won't tell you about it, but I won't tell you what it was, but he said, the, polling, the pollster said, what if it's bad news? Because he had interest in this particular effort that I'm describing to you. And I said, it doesn't matter if it's bad news. We want to know what the hell the truth is. Because we can deal with the truth. And if it isn't what we like, then we'll... But you can't deal with uh, an idea that feels good when it's got nothing to do with reality. Because you go down that road and pretty band-aid after band-aid after band-aid, and here we are. Here we are with PERS, for example, and everything else. The forests, which is, I have a place in my belly for the condition of our 29 million acres out there. Listen, let me move on to these statistics. This is great. I'm going to give you some statistics that you haven't heard before. Uh, we've done an issues poll, and we did 20 different issues, and the ones I don't talk about are kind of half and half. But I want to talk to you about the issues that are really hard one way or the other. The decisive issues, and there's three or four of them in here that you'll find it very interesting, I think. So many of, uh, several of these you may know already, but I'll guarantee you there would be some interesting stuff that I read to you. Every single person in here will find this interesting. Okay, I'll run through it quickly. Uh, if the election for governor of Oregon were held today, who would you vote? Would you vote to reelect Kate Brown, a Democrat, or would you vote for the Republican candidate? Overall, independents, Republicans, Democrats, for Kate, 44 percent; for the Republican, 48 percent. Independents, 52 percent Republican, 37 percent. Okay. It's, it's 52 for the Republican and 37 for her. Uh, do you believe Oregon has too much regulation on business or not enough regulation on business? This is a scientific poll. We did 1,000 people, and normally in a poll to get the kind of deviation you want to get, the, the accuracy you do 500, we did 1,000. Very scientifically created. So, 
People who, 47% of the electorate, and that is a breakdown, an accurate breakdown of Oregon, uh, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. 47% too much, 18% too little. Okay? Uh, the re, you know, the Republicans are off the charts. It's over 90%. Um, do you support or oppose sanctuary laws that protect undocumented immigrants from federal immigration authorities? Total support, 48.7. Total oppose, 47. I'm going to mention that one's pretty equal, okay? But this has to do with IP22. And I'll have another piece of this in a minute. Do you support or oppose local and state law enforcement turning over undocumented immigrants who have committed crimes to federal immigration authorities? How many do you think support that? Any guesses? 76%. Our friend Cynthia is going to have, I think, a good outcome down there with IP22 when that finally comes up. We're trying to get signatures now. Uh, total oppose? 18.9%. That's across the board. That's everybody. That's not just Republicans. Um, which should be a higher priority for Oregon government? Protecting the environment at all costs or utilizing our natural resources wisely to create jobs and economic growth? 57% is uh, utilize our natural resources. Prioritize the environment, 34%. That's across the board. And you can kind of decipher uh, where the Republicans would be and where the Democrats would be and where the independents might be, but that's the overall number. This, this portends well for the election in November. Uh, the public employee retirement system known as PERS is currently underfunded by an estimated $25 billion. How concerned are you about the PERS deficit? Total concern? Across the board, 68%. Total not concerned, 23%. That surprised me. I didn't think, it, I, you know, the kick in the can thing down the road goes just so far. Uh, and there's another one here. If leaders do not find a solution to the $25 billion PERS deficit, and it talks about police officers, classroom sizes, and so forth, total concern, 78%. Total not concerned, 17%. This is huge. Oregon and many other states have seen an increase in major forest fires in recent years, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which of the following options do you think is the best way to reduce future forest fires? A combination of selective logging to thin forests and comprehensive efforts to remove underbrush. Any guess? 62%. Not suppressing the fires and instead letting them burn, 5%. We're all from Portland. Yeah. There's no trees where those people live. Yeah. Or a lot of the fire crews that are out there, this has turned into an industry, hasn't it? Yeah. What was it, David, 50 billion two years ago? No, 50 million in fire suppression. Yeah, last year was the cost of fire suppression was approximately 50 million, and this year is approximately 500 million. Yep. That, folks, is a half a billion dollars. Yep. And every time there's a forest fire, we risk another hot shot incident. We can't afford that. Yeah. Here's the thing we need to get in there with equipment. There's 29 million acres uh, of forest. I think. 21 million is forest service, and then there's the O and C lands and the BLM and so forth. We need to get in there with mechanized equipment and young people with chainsaws mm -hmm. on those steep slopes, and we got to go in there. Diane and I were up in the Blues, up in the Wallawa Mountains last week, some great loggers and a logging job up there. You can go to the Facebook page, uh, Sam Carpenter for Oregon, and you can see a picture of us with these, just these great people. Uh, big landowners up there up on the job. And the mechanical things they can do now, they can just take a tree, if they're not going to use it for harvesting for, for lumber, and they just come down on it with a pod about this big around. Tree this big around. So there's nothing left. Nobody uses a chainsaw. If it's steep slope, you have to, because these equipments are on tractors and so forth, tracks. But uh, that was incredible. Uh, let me run through this quickly. Um, 
Regarding economic, social, and security issues Oregonians face, do you believe that the solution lies in more government interaction, uh, more government inter intervention, or less? Across the board, less government intervention, 56%. More government, government infor, uh, intervention, mostly, of course, Democrats, 17%. Independents, 13%. Republicans, 4.3%. And I want to drive this home. Uh, for independents, and that includes non-affiliated and independents, mostly non-affiliated, and I won't go into why there's so many non-affiliated, except it has to do with motor voter people who are not specif well, people who are not specifying what party they want to belong to are put into non-affiliated. 52% will vote Republican, 37% will vote for Kate Brown. This is really good news, folks, I, for all of us in November. Because what we want in November is the 2018 Oregon Red Trifecta. And what is that? A, re a political trifecta is when one party controls the House, the Senate, and the governor's seat. There are 27 red trifectas in the United States. There are seven blue, okay? What are the blue, what are the blue uh, trifectas? Well, there's California, and uh, there's Oregon, and then the rest of the five states, including Hawaii and I think Delaware. Uh, I, I don't have them memorized, but they're all small states back east. No, Washington's not a blue trifecta. It's a split. It's a split. What's that? It changed a few months ago. The Democrats have majorities in both houses. And okay, all right, and uh, I'll take you on that. I checked it last night on Wiki, and normally they would note it, note that. So it's that's fine. Anyway, there's way more red trifectas than there are blue. How many? Uh, of the 50 states were controlled by Republicans in 2010, 14, that's 28%. How many uh, legislatures are pure red in 2018? 34. 36. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a 34, it's, it's 68%. We've gone from 28% to 68%. How many governors are Republican, 68% coincidentally are. We, the first mistake we've made here as Republicans is we're not paying attention to what's going on in the rest of the country. Spent some time in Kentucky here in the last year and a half. They got the first red legislature, first red trifecta, and first red le uh, legislature in 102 years. Guess what they did in their first week last January, a year ago, the first week of uh, their legislative session, right to work. Oh, great. Hell, they just rammed it through. You know, of those uh, 27 red trifectas, I think something like 22 of them are super majorities. Bam, bam, bam. And you don't think, we don't have time to fool around with a Republican governor who very cleverly, David brought up, to come in and rearrange the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Okay, we don't need a moderate governor to come in there with a progressive far left legislature. Nothing's going to happen except everything gets worse. <laughs> we need to take the whole thing. We need to take the whole thing. So we've got a national fundraising mechanism we're setting up right now called uh, RedOregon.com. And we're raising money for these districts. Bob, you're a good man. <laughs> so Bob's district. Uh, would be one we would look at after the primary and uh, dump some money in there. And I have a, I have a, a three-man a company. I own a majority share as a, a social media marketing company that is world class, world class. And uh, what we'll do is we'll donate, and it can help pay with the funding from this, for these swing districts. And by golly, we can take this whole legislature uh, back along with the governor's seat. I know we can. I'm positive we can. So the second mistake we make, this myth that Oregon is a blue state. 
And we come to these meetings, oh, what are we going to do, you know? And you heard at the end of the legislative session, the uh, minority leader says, well, we sure slowed them down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, you didn't. They're laughing at you. They're laughing at you. Throw me a bone. Uh, and uh, every year in the article I see in the bulletin, well, we just want a place at the table. What kind of a thing is that? Do we really just want a place at the table? No, we want to own the table. We want, to, we want to be in charge. We were before. Yes. We can do it again. And now with Trump's momentum and what's happening in the rest of the country, my message is to all of you folks, hell, let's get her done. Let's get it done. But you're not going to do it with somebody who doesn't believe we can't get it done and just wants a place at the table. They'll throw you a bone as a legislator and you say, thank you, thank you. And they'll walk away laughing at you. That's what they do. You know that's true. Now, what is a progressive? Okay, let me tell you what a progressive is, and we don't talk about this. A progressive is somebody who doesn't like us at all. In fact, these people hate us. It's 20% of the population, the voting population. I'd say 40% of Democrats are progressives. These are the people that you can't make common sense with. These are the people that are telling you things that are just ridiculous. These are the people that cruise the, the left-wing blogs and they would never watch one minute of Fox News because it might poison their perfect, their perfect brains, okay? It might poison their, their beautiful brains that have been taught that all Republicans are selfish. They feel we're intellectually, spiritually, morally inferior to them. You all know that. They don't like us. They want to help us get along, but they need our votes. Somebody's got to get out there and say that. What do we got to lose? We're on the verge of a supermajority on the other side? The hell with it. We got nothing to lose here. There's a book and there's a chapter in here called Gun to the Head Enlightenment. When you get to a place in a business where you got to do something, and maybe it's a crazy thing, but if you don't do it, you're going to miss the next payroll. And that's the end of your business. I've been there. And that's where we are now. We have nothing to lose. Nothing at all. And who is the average Democrat? I'll tell you the average Democrat. More than half of Democrats are your neighbors. And you work with them. And they're good people. And they're sitting at the table at Thanksgiving and Christmas. They're your kids. They're good people. But the progressive far left element of the Democrat Party, I'd say 40%, and 20% of our total voting population has been in charge of, in Salem for how many years? And I ask you why. Why is that? Because we have been intimidated by them. Oh, we're so blue, Oregon's so blue. You know, the rest of the country does think we're nuts. They do. I'm an Oregonian, I don't feel bad sitting up here and saying that. I've spent so much time with Diana in Kentucky in the last year and a half. They really think we're nuts. What? Honey, describe to me how you, some of your friends saw me coming in in my Subaru. Well, it, it, it becomes a little bit of a joke, and, and no offense, but even when I met Sam, I thought, oh my God, here's a, lots of drinking, pot, smoke, and cigarettes. And he said, I'm not a liberal. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I do what, I was very, very I, happy to find out that he is very conservative, like you said, almost as conservative as I am. He's very conservative, and um, he is absolutely not a pot smoker. <laughs> but he does drive a Subaru. <laughs> <laughs> I do not drink many lattes. And, I, yeah, I drink my coffee lattes, black. But he does drive a yeah. Subaru, but I'm working on that. So. <laughs> so a little more about me. My background is seriously blue collar and all kinds of stuff before I was the age of 30, before I bought a business, became an author, before I became a consultant. But I fit right in, I love those people in Stearns. I fit right into the small towns uh, environment. I'm from a very small town, John, you know this, from upstate New York, New Yorkers. Uh, very small town, way, way uh, far upstate, very poor town, devastated by taxes, by offshoring, by all of it. Polish people, Irish people, Italian people. We told Polak jokes back then, and the my Polish friends thought it was hilarious, and everybody wasn't offended all the time. 
But I'll tell you, rural America has been devastated. I don't care where you go. Douglas County, Lewis County, McCurry County, Kentucky, this is the new inner city, is our rural towns. 275 of them in Oregon, less than 5,000 each in population. Devastated. And Bend would have been, except it happens to be a great place to live because of the mountains and the water and you know the rivers and the trout and uh, all this stuff, Smith Rock, the whole thing. But most of those towns, you've been through them, you know what I'm talking about. Those people have no opportunity. Why? Because these people decided this owl was reason enough to drive those loggers out of the hills. That's no problem, learn to use a computer. Well, my daddy was a logger and his daddy was a logger. I don't want to learn a computer. I want to run a chainsaw. I want to set chokers. I want my son to set chokers when he's 14 years old. I want to keep wearing those cork boots and those logger world suspenders because this is my life. And they were kicked out. I got a place in my belly for those folks. If I become governor, that's my number one personal thing I want to do is fix our forests and fix those small towns. And in doing that, as a businessman, coming back to towns like this and helping a small businessman get back on his feet. Less regulation, less taxes, less government. Man. Um, so here's the mistake we've been making. We have been identifying Democrats as the enemy. They're not the enemy. It's a progressive far left. Stop yourself when you start bashing Democrats with your friends. These are your people too. I was a Democrat, my daddy was a Democrat, my whole family was a Democrat. Stop bashing the very people we need to vote for us in November. That's insane. But tear the hell out of the progressive far left. Throw it back in their faces. And this is what we haven't been doing. This is error number five, I guess, on my list. Um, Accept that they hate us, accept that they will never meet us, in the, they, will never, they will never allow us to cross the aisle and make sense. When we cross the aisle, they're laughing at us. This crossing the aisle stuff is what's got us into trouble. Well, these are reasonable people we need to meet halfway. How, how often have you heard that? That's insane. You can't meet halfway with crazy people. <laughs> Do you argue with a drunk? Does anybody? You go to a mental institution and walk in and start having a big conversation with somebody who can't put their pants on in the morning? And I don't mean to be mean about it or anything, but these people you cannot reason with. They need to be removed from power. And so I risk, what I risk is coming across as a crazy guy. But believe me, I'm not. But this is what has to happen. We have to remove these people from power we want to have bipartisanship. We need Democrats. They've got good ideas in there. But this progressive far left stuff has killed this state and it's made a mockery out of the state and the rest of the country sees it. Let me tell you something. There's some people back east who would be real interested in seeing a red trifecta happen and there's some people back east who really think it can happen. We're only 10% off on the voting, voting rolls. 10%? Uh, let's see, we got 38% Democrats and 28% Republican. That's not that much. It's 10 points, and that's about what Trump lost by here. Some time has gone by. Can you imagine where we'll be next November, the way things are going now, what he's accomplished despite the onslaught? The media is insane. We all know that. And they're just making more and more fools of themselves. Can you imagine where we're going to be with this man by November of next year? And that's what I've calculated in. I was the only, as I said, I think I mentioned it before, I'm the only statewide candidate that did uh, endorse him. Maybe I didn't mention it. I'm the only statewide candidate who endorsed him before the primaries in 2016. Nobody inside the state endorsed him either. And I did it with a press release and a, and a TV appearance. Uh, he's a CEO. I'm a CEO. I understand where he's coming from. And don't talk to me about the Billy Bush tapes. Go back in my life, maybe you'll find something weird. The man has one goal, and that is to fix this country. He has enough money, he's got a supermodel wife, he's got everything he ever wanted. He's no fool. 
And he comes out of every time he gets nailed down, he comes back, he comes back, he comes back. I knew that was the kind of man he was when he came down the elevator. I knew it before because I knew about Donald Trump. Uh, boy, I had, as he went up and down through the, through the elections, I was thinking, well, I wish he wouldn't say that. Or why did he do this? And why did he do that? He's a showman. He stepped out from 16 people, and that's how he did it. The guy's brilliant. He's a mastermind. He's not perfect. I get that. This guy is a CEO. And you've seen a lot of jobs go away just from natural attrition in the federal government. That's what has to happen in Salem. A lot of these folks need to go. They need to get jobs in the private sector. What is the solution? The solution is a booming economy. And that's what will happen if we can stop the government from sucking up so much money and tamping down private industry, which is what they're doing. Taxing us to death. And I, I don't even want to carry on this argument that we have to get this done or it's the end of the road. We've been talking like that since 2009. What we need to talk about now is what we're going to do. And we're going to have a red trifecta in Oregon. Can you imagine those people who will remain nameless back east, what it will be like for them and for the whole country, for Oregon, the craziest state in the country, to go from blue to red, not just the governor, the whole damn thing. Can you imagine? This is a stake in the heart of progressivism all across the country. It's huge. This is a movement. This is massive. And we're putting people on so fast on our Facebook page, and it's mostly viral. We do a little boosting like everybody does what they call boosting. But this is viral. It doesn't matter what I put up. We have pictures of our dog. Christmas. I, ha I spent all Christmas answering comments about our dog. And then we did a, a mistake and we put the dog and you and me up on a picture, uh, up on a photo on the Facebook page for New Year's too. Oh man. People are so excited about the idea of turning this thing upside down. And young people are too. You should have seen the rally we had down. It was a rally. It was just a meeting down at the University of Oregon. Can you imagine that? They were on fire down there. And we've got a whole movement across the state of young people, of college kids. I mean, look at us. What's our average age here? <laughs> You're the young guy. He's the young guy. So we've got to have a legacy. And I'm telling you, this next generation after the millennials, tagging on to the end of the millennials, they're on fire. And they don't care about what the millennials think. But they're looking back, and uh, they're looking back, and they're looking forward, and they're saying, "This is not what I want. I'm not buying into this." Uh, there's a whole lot of young people coming up. Do not give up hope when you look around and you see the gray hair all around here. By November of this fall, wow, and Oregon's going to be on Fox and Friends and all that stuff, and CNN's going to have to shape up, and so is MSNBC, or they can just continue to lose share. MSNBC is kind of a weird situation over there, but that's where progressives go. Uh, I'm very excited about what's going on, can you tell? Uh, let me see, so I didn't miss anything here, and I'll be ready to take some questions. Uh, here's a quote. Odd pretensions of the progressive far left. They believe, here's, here's what, let me, let me jump away from that. Here's what conservatives really think of the progressive far left. Pretentious, incompetent fools. That's what we got in Salem. Pretentious, incompetent fools. And if somebody doesn't say that, the truth, remember I talked about the truth? That is the truth. Kate Brown is a bureaucrat. Kate Brown was never meant to be a CEO. Anybody who's watched her and watched her performance knows she's not a leader. She's not a CEO. She's a bureaucrat that had to take over the job of governor, and she was glad to do it because of, she lives in a 10,000-foot house and, and all that stuff. The worst part of it, maybe, maybe equally bad about Kate Brown, is she's got a business plan, and there should be some kind of a business plan when you have a business. Her business plan is really, really bad. You know what that is? That's the progressive far left ideology that has nothing to do with you and me, but has everything to do with power and controlling us because we aren't capable of taking care of our own selves. There, I said it. It's on camera. Uh, 
So anyway, let me read you one more quote, and then I'll stop talking here. Uh, so pr the uh, progressive far left, or you could say far left progressives, separate them from the Democrat Party. Don't badmouth Democrats. I wouldn't even badmouth liberals. I don't go out of my way to explain this to people, but it's the truth. It's the progressive far left leadership that's the problem. And there are an awful lot of hard hat Democrats out there. I used to be one in these unions that voted for Donald Trump. And if they could see a place to come in November, they're coming. They're coming. The independents are coming. The hard hat blue collar guys are coming. The, uh, the teachers are coming. They're all coming. And one thing that's going to pave the way is the Supreme Court Janus case that's coming up. It's going to punch a big hole in the civil unions, civil service unions out there. And uh, I'm really excited about that. And I think that's going to come in May or so. Uh, so Michael Walsh, Michael Walsh says, and this is a very brief um, quote, the only weapon they have is our own weakness. The only weapon they have is our own weakness. It is our wish, you and me, or our legislators, to be seen as reasonable, as proportional, as measured, that hinders us from taking decisive action against them. Michael Walsh. Reading recommendations, David Horowitz, Big Agenda, mandatory reading. Another one is uh, Anthony Cotavilla, uh, and uh, his book is uh, The Ruling Class. Those two books, you will get what I'm talking about here. I read a lot of books, but those two stand out. Uh, we need to throw it back in their faces. We need not to take it anymore. And we need to understand that their only weapon is our own weakness in the legislature or wherever. Now, the Oregon governor has a lot of power compared to, say, the governor of Texas. And when I go in there, these, these steering committees and these heads of the departments, they might as well quit before I take office between November and January. They might as well leave. Anybody who doesn't climb on our agenda of rebuilding this thing and reducing its size and making it better for the people of Oregon is going to be gone. You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. So uh, that's what we're doing, and I really appreciate you. Uh, there's an envelope there for you. My card, hey, here's something. My card, you see the card on the table? You see that picture? That's me in the middle. I worked, I ran a survey crew for the Forest Service in 1976, and that was my crew. And my, my uh, son was born two years before. My daughter was born two days after that photo was taken in Gold Beach. Uh, in case you're wondering what that is. Thank you, everybody. I want you to take the question. No, I want you to take questions, but I want to cheat and ask the first one. Okay. And that has to do with your polling, how much of it or was done with Multnomah County? It was a perfect breakdown by population. So uh, it was proportional. Now, between Eugene and Portland are 52% of all the votes in the state. I think it's something like 15% on the east. 20% over here, I'm not adding the numbers in my head, and 8% on the coast. It was done exactly proportional. It was a scientific poll. So there was more done in Multnomah County. That answers your question, it right? It does. Yeah. Very good. This was, a, this was an accurate poll. Yes, Jeff. Uh, I know this is, scenario is not in your roadmap, but in the unlikely event that you do not win the primary, will you actively campaign for the one who does? Uh, I will support the one who does, but I'm not going to say up here exactly what I'll do. Actively campaign means I've got to go through this. Uh, the traveling is killing us from Bend. Uh, I will support the candidate uh, vigorously. But I, I can't say here, you know, actively campaign means to me and to Mark Callahan here, going to all these meetings and it's, it's hard to say, Jeff. Yes? I just wanted to say that it will be such a privilege to have Diana as First Lady. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Isn't she beautiful? She is gorgeous and smart and speaks well, and she likes to speak to any Republican groups. Uh, 
She speaks well. She was a two-time Chamber of Commerce. She ran, she was on 10 boards of directors when I met her. She's highly educated. I won't tell you how many degrees she's got. Uh, she's smarter than me, but, you know. That's all right. You are smarter than most of you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I walked to the gym. We may rule the country, but we control the world. So are you willing to run a campaign that will be forcing Kate to run on her record? Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Read some David Horowitz. No kidding. we got to throw it back in her face. It's an endless, endless library of topics. Yes. And I have no, the polling shows me uh, polling much better than an existing uh, legislator. As an outsider, I poll higher, generically speaking. I don't have a legislative record where you can go back, why did you vote for that over there? Well, because this and this and we were trading back and forth. I don't have any of that. And I've never been arrested. I don't have any restraining orders. I've never had a, you know, a DUI. And, and all that stuff, and and I've got I've got uh, there's not much they can go after me. They get, my beautiful wife. She's they can go after me for that if they want. And the supermodel wife. Yeah. I heard from Portland that all the lawyers in Portland, two major law firms, they write all the legislation, and the legislation is taken down in the water and holds New Salem, and they slice them up so they can get their votes, and then they just Yes, and that's what happens in D.C. on K Street. The attorneys write it up. The special interest attorneys write it up. They give it to the legislators. They do promise them money, and that's how it works. I got all the money I need. I'm not a billionaire. I got all the money I need. I got all the time I want to take. I got nothing to gain, you know, from going in there and taking money from anybody. My top. I won't take any more than 25,000 campaign contribution, for instance, and my competitors always already taken a half a million from somebody. That's a leash around your neck, you know? And, and so uh, I don't need to do this. I just want to do it. This is what I understand about Donald Trump, why he's doing this. This is his great challenge of his life. This is my great challenge of my life. I will never be president. I'm too old. But I would love to get in the middle of this state and clean those forests up and make it better for the business people around here and give our kids a future. We're screwing our kids. Yes. Yeah. That's an awful way to end a, a presentation. No, to say that. that. That's no. a bad last sentence. Well, we want something better. I've got three new great granddaughters. Yeah. And I want a state for them that was lovely, that I remember the Oregon I came to in 1953. <laughs> I want them to have those things. Yes, Jim. So I'll give you something positive to end on. Campaign issue. Pure traffic congestion in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> and South Florida. Well, and yeah. Okay. Rain in TriMet. Bring in TriMet. Rain in. Rain in TriMet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're bring them in. Go there, are, there are some big departments in the state that should be prioritized and there's some departments in the state that should be eliminated. Oh, and another really big issue is neighborhood preservation. We're tearing down, yeah. tearing down great houses and replacing with million dollar junk all over inner Portland. We could, that's a big border base. We could talk about what's happening in Savannah, Georgia with that. Yeah. Those seven ladies got together preserving these old homes out there uh, putting money together. Yeah, I'm hearing you, man. Yeah. Anything else? Is, is it, if I, I want to make a presentation to him. Oh! I found these new pens. <laughs> thank you. And I, I want to thank you, and you certainly have lived up to the reputation that I thought you might. And oh, I'm, thank I'm, you, I, Billy. I, I really yeah. am pleased and excited. I think uh, uh, we all are, because we're, we want our Oregon back, and we want a winner. And it sounds like we have one. Thank you, Billy. You're welcome. Now, I see John Goodhouse is back here, and I wanted to have John come up and say hi.